Uh, she's fun. not going to attribute it to anybody. It's just, just like got it. Cool. Audience question. Um. So. Oh. Uh oh. <laughs> <It's troubling. laughs> hey, Derek. Smiling starts now. These are bloopers. Oh, oh. <laughs> no, we are apparently live. <laughs> this is all bloopers, everybody. Whoa. Hey. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Man, we are two years into this and we are still We're a motley out crew how to make here. this work. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, well, but... we are glad to be with you. <laughs> <laughs> Add a little spontaneity to us there today. There we go. Uh, <laughs> but we welcome back, everybody. I am Jayatri Das, Chief Bioscientist here at the Franklin Institute, um, joined by my awesome team members here. Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer, Daryl Williams, our Senior Vice President of Science and Education and our resident engineer. And our special guest today is our colleague, Adam Piazza, who is our producer and talent manager. So he's gonna bring a little bit of a different insight into our usual conversation of fascinating science headlines and other things in the current events. Um, so send us your questions as we go through our list of topics today. Um, Derek, you are leading us off um, with a discussion of terraforming. So first things first, what does that word mean? <laughs> so today, yes, we're going to bring to you this exciting topic that seems to be really popular in society today, the idea that we might be able to convert an, an unlivable planet into a habitable planet. And this is the concept of terraforming, making another planet like Earth, right? So this concept has been around in science fiction for quite some time, actually, the idea of converting a planet. Kim Stanley Robinson wrote a famous three-part uh, trilogy called Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars. Red Mars, Blue Mars, Green Mars. That's the right one. And it talked about the idea of converting Mars into a habitable place. And most recently, it's Elon Musk that has picked up this idea of possibly converting Mars to a more Earth-like environment. And then on top of that, NASA's chief planetary scientist, Jim Green, has recently suggested the possibility that this actually might be workable, but I think that's up for debate. So it's a popular thought these days. Maybe we can turn some other place into a place more like Earth. So, so, so Derek, this is kind of making me think of so, like what was that like Biosphere Two or something where you know that experiment where we essentially like built a giant bubble in the desert and turned the bubble into this like habitable self-contained environment. Like, is that what I should be imagining? Is that we're going to just like build this bubble on Mars? No, that's what the logical thinkers would go for, Jeff. <laughs> something along those lines. But the more avant-garde sort of uh, out there thinkers put across this idea of how about, how about if we just turn Mars into a place like Earth? Let's give it more water. Let's give it an atmosphere. Let's warm it up. And then, hey, we can uh, make it just like Earth. Yeah, right? Well, there's another piece to that that has to be considered. And it's something that people rarely think about when they think about terraforming. And it is the real reason why Mars is the way it is. For the most part, Mars has very little atmosphere because it has no magnetic field to protect it from this solar wind, the electromagnetic particles that are blasting through the solar system. That, electro that electromagnetic wind has been stripping the atmosphere from Mars for billions of years. So if you wanna do anything, the first thing you're gonna to have to do is figure out how to protect Mars from that extreme sort of environment of electromagnetic particles. And this is the idea that NASA chief scientist Jim Green has come up with of creating a protective shield that would protect Mars from the solar wind. Now, I say it like that because first and foremost, first thing that we have to think about is, isn't there a lot of 
energy required for doing something like that? So that's exactly what I was going to ask. How much energy is required? And if we're going to be in the business of creating an atmosphere and a protective atmosphere for Mars, why couldn't we try to repair our own? <laughs> Oh, come on. What fun is that? <laughs> so I'm just curious, you know, the order of operation here, like what, what's, what's happening with that? Um, are there some lessons that could be applied here on Earth that before we, you know, I'm not trying to poo-poo everybody, anybody's ambitious for transforming Mars atmosphere and, and uh, uh, ecology to be able to, to uh, support life. But I'm just curious if there's uh, some reconsiderations that we, we might need to make here, particularly from an engineering perspective and science perspective. I think you're on the right track, Daryl. I mean, uh, you can, I, I'm sure that you can imagine uh, all of the different engineering scenarios that have to go along with this to, to try to make something like this possible. And it always brings to mind the question for me about uh, science fiction and the reality of our technological advances, which comes first? Does the need for a technological advance come first or does science fiction create a scenario? Does life imitate art or does art imitate life is the, is the kind of question here you know, that you can think of. And on the fantastic side, wow, what a consideration to be able to convert another planet into an Earth-like place. You know, but on the other hand, cannot we use those technologies or will those advancements towards that goal bring us technologies that we can apply to where we are now and how do we make earth you know the place it really needs to be how do we protect this planet against the harms that we've been creating through our technological advance and uh, thereby sort of circumvent the need altogether uh, for trying to redo another planet I think from like a pop culture standpoint, I feel like we should make sure people watch like The Martian and like Total Recall. I think we get like different scales on how well or bad that works. So if you know, if life imitating art, we should make sure people are referencing the art. Be like, I, I saw what happens in that movie. Let's figure out how not to have that happen in reality. So that's a great angle as well for that one. Yeah. I was thinking, Adam, that yeah, you you know, from from your perspective, like you have from coming from the design world, right? Like this idea of you have to imagine it before you can create it is something that's kind of inherent to that design um, process. Whereas we, you know, I think that is now being infused into science in, in kind of different ways. Yeah, I mean, like for me, my studies came from like a world of architecture. So it was always a way of understanding how you need to build something that serves the human function, right? Architecture is all about like that human experience. It's how do we interact with a space, right? So it comes down to enjoyment, but also the psychology of the space, you know, going into a room with a low ceiling probably makes you feel, you know, tense or anxious. Um, and then that kind of goes into the idea of how you communicate that, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in architecture school, you know, you're trying to communicate an idea that's for the most part vague. So then how do you properly communicate that? And that's where design comes in. You know, does it look like the, per the function it serves, the purpose and how that works together? So if you're trying to envision what terraforming looks like, you know, what does that actually look like? You know, is it a, a you know, imaginable glass dome around it, aka just an ozone, you know, or is it like this like metal metallic brutalism, therefore it's not as welcoming. So how do we interpret the concept yeah. of, terraforming. The other thing that made me think of Adam is that the way that Derek you were describing it it's it feels like we're just trying to turn Mars into kind of like a replica of earth systems. But Adam you kind of talked about how design is really the interaction between humans and the world around us. And so what adjustments will humans have to make um, to live on a terraformed? I think it's really interesting how uh, the the fantasy of terraforming is so attractive that we allow ourselves to suspend reality about certain kinds of things. I mean, we, we still have to remember that Mars actually, the gravitational pull on Mars is only one third that of the gravitational pull on Earth. So that raises all sorts of other questions and causes all kinds of other problems that are related specifically to the design and operation of the human body. So there's all that 
question two, uh, along with the fantastic ideas of being able to fly around in the Martian atmosphere with a minimal jetpack in a very sleek and form-fitting spacesuit of some sort, you know, with a glass fishbowl helmet kind of idea. Um, one of our one of our uh, program uh, watchers uh, says a comment from the audience is that I personally believe it would be quicker and easier to fly to the nearest Earth-like planet in our galaxy rather than try to terraform one of the one of the planets here. I should point out that Green also suggested that perhaps we might be able to convert Venus into a more Earth-like location. And there's, we've got another comment that I think is, is, a, is another good point, is that if you're trying to transform you know, the atmosphere of a planet, it's how do you, you, know, how do you infuse those uh, elements like ozone into the atmosphere, but also keep them from escaping, right? So it, there's, it's this like fine line of like going just far, but not too far. So, okay, um, based on that hot takes here, <laughs> Adam, what do you think? Would you go, would you go live on terraformed Mars? I mean, yes. Um, I feel like if the, if the need is we have to live there because Earth's like no longer inhabitable, then my choices are nil. But if it's like, I get to visit, you know, terraformed Mars, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Like I am yeah. someone who will like travel across the country for a, a three-day music festival. Will I travel to Mars for like Mars Fest 2048? Absolutely. It's yeah. Gonna, it's gonna have a great lineup, new air. My taste buds might be affected by different atmospheric pressure. So maybe I'll be like eating some weird stuff too. Like I'm all for that experience for sure. I'm, I'm going to piggyback off of Adam's answer. I was thinking the same thing. I'm all here for space tourism. So absolutely pay a visit. I don't think uh, at this stage uh, I, I'm willing to, to, to you know, risk uh, living there per se. Uh, as a space travel romantic with the idea that, gee, it would be fabulous to travel through space, uh, I'm going for no on this one. <laughs> I'll do a trip to the moon, you know. and Start, start closer and to home. Start closer to home with the lava tubes uh, underground and the and the bubble environments, the glass bubble environments. I'll go for that before I go for the trip to Mars. It's a little bit of a ways out there for me to uh, get back in time for stuff I might want to do here. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm a little bit nervous about you know, it, will it actually work well enough? You know, our bodies are so well adapted to the systems here on Earth that maybe it's it's it's, it's I don't know. It's it's pretty risky. So. I, I might play it close to home as well, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so next on our list, kind of a good uh, transition there because we've been talking about you know, transforming an experience in, on an extraplanetary location. But Adam, you think about how to transform environments here on Earth. Tell us a little bit about you, what you do, and yeah. what, what, are, what is this all about immersive experiences? Absolutely. Um, so at the museum, I am the um, experiences producer and talent manager. So what that really works on is looking at how we engage with our audiences, right, when we're on the floor. Uh, there's limitations, obviously, with the built environment, but a big thing is how do we engage and immerse people into an experience? Um, and so a lot of people, when they hear of immersive experience, they're like, what does that mean? Does it mean I have to go into VR? Is it like a helmet situation? Um, and really immersive is just a way of how do you engage and absorb somebody in whether it's a real or an imagined world, right? So are you trying to ground it to send me somewhere that's like in the bottom of the ocean, which normally most people can't get to, or are you creating something fantastical? Um, and so it's been around for a while. And even if I think about like pop culture, Derek mentioned science fiction. I always remember there's a story in the Ray Bradbury novel, The Illustrated Man. And it, I mean, it, it has a very ominous turn, which most Ray Bradbury stories will take you anyway. Um, but it's like the idea of these kids being in this space that's surrounded in screens and they're in like the African safari, but then through the narrative of the story, it goes a little too far. Um, and so what's funny is like, I remember reading that story and seeing the popularity now of places like Arctic House, which has outposts in different cities. Um, and the most common one now that's just popping up everywhere are all those immersive Van Gogh experiences, which I find just crazy that there's 
so many that you can be in a city traveling and there's three competing Van Gogh, the immersive experience, immerse go van the experience. I probably just made up that last one, but it'll happen probably in next year. Um, but the idea of like, what does it mean to be engaged with that? And, you know, how do we then apply that into a science museum? Um, there are ways to incorporate it with, you know, art. And there's always discussion of like, you know, is this how Van Gogh wanted you to appreciate his painting? So, you know, you can't look back. Van Gogh didn't know that technology was present. But there's also a difference in getting someone exposed to the world with this immersive environment versus getting the opportunity to see that painting, right? Those are two different experiences. Um, and so ways that like I bring that into or what I do from personal experience is I love attending music festivals. And I think a lot of them do a good job at creating a narrative. And that's a big part of what creates that immersive experience is what's the story and how do I get invested into that? Um, and then on top of that, you include the senses, you know, am I hearing something different? Am I smelling something different? Um, and then ways to personalize it. It should feel sort of guided, but it's, it's a story that's being told. What's your story? How do you apply your story to that narrative? Um, and so looking at how we work with that in the museum, everyone comes into science with a different level of knowledge, right? So what do you do to create that path for someone visiting a place like a museum where they're learning something, they're entertained, but they also feel inspired? So I think that's where those worlds come together. So right now I work on that with, you know, day to day, work on developing the shows, but in the past we've tested that out with stuff like Science After Hours, uh, which you've been part of, Derek's been part of, and Daryl's been part of, and we see different ways of engaging the public for those type of events. So Adam, a lot of what you said really connected with what we know about like the science of how people learn, yeah. right? Is that, you know, you mentioned like a multi-sensory experience. And, you know, we know, you know, from neuroscience that, you know, being able to experience something with multiple senses creates for a stronger memory. Yeah. You talked about the role of like narrative and personalization and being able to connect something, you know, with things that you were already familiar with. Um, helps bring that in. But we have this, you know, a, a great insight from somebody in the audience saying, you know, immersion is an experience that leaves you forgetting about the outside world, something you got yourself lost in. Yeah. Uh, and I think where the science to me comes in there is that, again, what we know is kind of the most exciting time to learn is when you're at this optimal level of novelty, that something is yeah. new to you, right? If it's yep. like, but, but there's like a downside to that too, right? If it's too new, then it's kind of scary and intimidating. Yes. And if it's too familiar, then your brain kind of turns off because it's just like, yeah, 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 right? Yeah. And, um, and so I think that's kind of where you're going for is that like that, that optimum level of kind of novelty, but still feeling like, okay, I can deal with this. Absolutely. And I think, you know, if I look back at one of like a festival experience I've gone to, it's called Electric Forest in Michigan. You know, it's in the middle of the woods. You already got this sense of like feeling relaxed. It's, you know, a little bit hippie-esque. But then they add on like a room called the hangar, which transports you to this like 1940s USO space area where there's a scavenger hunt and people dressed as like Rosie the Riveter giving you body massages with car buffers, right? That just sounded like the weirdest tangent I went on. And it's not for everyone but there are people who want that level of like escapism right so you can opt into it you don't want to be forced into it just like with anything consent is amazing so you never want to you know bombard someone with something they may not be comfortable in um, and so I think when you bring it back to like the science realm one of my favorite products I'm not sure if it ever like became a thing that someone tried launching two or three years ago was they tried selling a cologne that smelled like space, which is an incredible concept because we all know, yes, space exists. We are all familiar with scents. Not everyone's gonna know, and how do you smell space? You know, helmets off, great one momentary experience. Um, but they were like, oh yeah, through science, they realized it had hints of like beef jerky and I think maybe whiskey. And I'm like, space sounds like it smells awesome. So like, <laughs> imagine like being in a space where it smells like that and you're being told through scientific research, 
this is what space smells like. And that you're in a dark so, room. Yeah. And then, so Adam, as you're talking, you're making me think about the idea or, or concept of perception. And so that's the perception of those individuals and how they are portraying what they believe space smells like, right? Yeah. So how, I'm just curious how that comes into the, as you're designing these experiences, how you're thinking about notions of human perception. I think a lot of it comes down to, um, what are, what are just blanking on right there? It's the idea of how someone perceives it and that sense of whimsy, right? You know, there are ways that currently nowadays people can absorb science in many different ways, in many fantastical ways, right? So there's, you know, videos people can watch of like the largest elephant toothpaste kind of demonstration, right? And so it's great that that outlet exists, but, you know, here then maybe it doesn't make sense that we try to do it that big. So what are different ways that we can help people perceive science in a very fun and inspiring way? You know, it has them leaving, asking questions. It has them wanting to know more. And like, maybe they'll find those answers here, but if they don't, hopefully they go home and they find it out, you know, themselves as well. You know, I was, in, I was intrigued, Adam, uh, about your comment about going into this experience where, uh, uh, people have auto have car buffers that they yeah. provide massages and you said that was an odd sort of segue but yes indeed it was that concept kind of stuck in my mind and there's a comment here from someone that says if we're robots i could use a buffing yeah so yeah. um uh i when you talk about this stuff though it reminds me uh of you know i've been in the visual entertainment world for a really long time now uh as a planetarium director writing and producing planetarium shows that's one kind of immersive experience that's been around for a little bit but i recall the you know the premiere of the imax industry in which uh the imax corporation making these giant screen films played with a lot of different ideas related to immersion what what is immersion how do people perceive a, a immersion really in this giant screen field and I recall that at one time there was a product that IMAX had that I think only survived one actual installation of something that was called magic carpet. And IMAX magic carpet was a screen that you would see typically in a theater and some kind of facility with a glass floor where you could see another projected image. And it was meant to give you the immersive experience of it actually flying. I never saw it, but I heard it was a remarkable thing, but it didn't really go very far. And I think part of it was cost, but I also remember that part of the work that was being done around this also delved into how we perceive immersion in different ways and how our brain processes visual information. And I recall sitting in a meeting once with a group of people who were discussing the possibility of a, an IMAX film about the brain, talking about the different ways that the brain processes visual imagery. And I remember one person said that there's a difference between how the brain processes images on a screen, like a reflected image mm -hmm. from a movie screen versus something like a television screen that's not reflective. Now, I haven't dug into it to find out more about that, but what impressed me was the idea that they were going as far as trying to understand how the brain processes information to come to some sense of immersiveness. I think, Derek, like what you're getting at is you know, the, the kind of physicality of how mm -hmm. we how our senses process an mm -hmm. immersive experience. But you know, there's a there's a note from somebody who remembers their experience in the Titanic exhibit and how being attached to a person mm -hmm. who had been a passenger, that kind of emotional connection really mm -hmm. takes, you know, takes yeah. all of that kind of mechanical processing and elevates to that emotional connection. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, that, that's kind of where we're trying to get to is that by creating a, a world, you're, you're emotionally transporting somebody to a different place, whether it's joy or yeah. whether it's, you know, discovery or, or mm, thunder, mm -hmm. you know. And mm -hmm. I think Derek brings up like a good point when he talked about like the IMAX. I think nowadays as we move along, we think 
oh, technology is what's really going to give us that immersive experience. And it helps, but it's definitely not the end all be all for an mm -hmm. immersive experience, right? I think you can do it in the most low tech way. It just comes into how you really incorporate people into something that feels engaging. So, you know, mm -hmm. as we look at what technology offers, whether it's, you know, screens that don't need a projector, the images just appear or whatever, we can see how that helps aid the story, but we know not to rely on it. I yeah. think that personal experience that someone has is what dictates, you know, that. Like, if you think of like the, one of the strangest immersive experiences, I feel like when you're younger, like going to like a mall in like the late 90s, early 2000s, might be considered like an immersive experience, right? You know, they're trying to sell you on something. You walk in, you smell that pretzel. You, you know, there's there's something strange about how subconsciously these experiences were being created. We just didn't realize like how much they stick in your brain when you involve everything. All right, well, I'm going to jump off of your segue in about technology to yeah. move us to our next topic. Um, so this one's all about technology and emerging <laughs> technology <laughs> and maybe has some elements of, of you know, how to create a, a user experience here. Daryl, you've been thinking about uh, electric vehicle technology and how that's changing and what's coming up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, electric, electric vehicles or EVs, as they're called for short, are really just becoming more and more um, of a hot topic and and expanding in terms of uh, sales uh, compared to when they were first sort of brought online. And you can even think too about the transition right back when um, Toyota introduced the Prius and that sort of opened the door to the hybrid models. And then now we're, uh, as the technology advances, we're getting more and more sophisticated with our ability to design electric vehicles with the hopes that uh, soon that will be those types of vehicles will become so ubiquitous that they will basically make um, internal combustion engine cars obsolete. Uh, and so this has car uh, production uh, or uh, the auto industry and the uh, subsidiary or auxiliary uh, technologies and companies that support that industry really thinking and rethinking this particular sector. And so I just wanted to sort of bring everybody up to speed. So actually in 2021, there was a 168% increase in sales compared to 2020. So these, there's definitely uh, interest that continues to grow and to, and to peak for, for consumers uh, to move in this direction. And so you have the likes of Nissan, General Motors, Ford, and others that have announced their plans to move their productions to become more electric vehicle focused in the next decade or so. And so this is really pushing the field. Now, there have been some challenges in terms of production with the chips, the, the need for different um, uh, like rare earth metals and things of that nature to actually make the batteries that, base, that supports the design of the electric vehicles. But that aside, there is definitely a push to keep moving up this in this direction. And just so that people kind of know from a science perspective, what's the difference between an electric vehicle and an internal combustion vehicle? So an electric vehicle runs on a motor. And so that motor converts the electrical energy to mechanical energy, which is the, bat the battery, right? The internal combustion uh, engine, so it's a motor versus an engine. So I just described the motor. An engine actually converts fuel into mechanical power. And so the difference there actually, which is considerable when you think about it is the, the, when you convert the power in the motor from electrical um, energy to mechanical energy, you actually get a much more uh, uh, affordances in terms of efficiencies of how that particular vehicle operates. And you actually get better performance. And in fact, in some cases, some of the automobiles that have been designed with EVs can go zero to 60 in like two seconds. Right, so we're talking rapidly, much, much faster than an com uh, internal combustion uh, vehicle. So I'm just gonna quickly share just a couple of examples. I perused Wired uh, Magazine or Wired.com and they um, have some examples where of a couple of vehicles, again, all different makes and models and sizes and things of that nature. Of course, most of us are familiar with the likes of Tesla and some other companies that focus on making electric vehicles exclusively. This particular I have to model. say, Daryl, I'm going to interrupt you because sure. when you said you were going to pull up a picture of an electric vehicle, I was not expecting a picture of a Hummer. A uh, Hummer, yes. So let me tell you why I'm pulling up this Hummer because it's quite impressive. 
So this is the GMC Hummer electric vehicle, um, basically designed in the same way that they were designed before in terms of body um, and all of the features and, and that nature. But what makes this particular vehicle impressive is it has some additional degrees of freedom that they've added to, to its design. So this particular vehicle can actually do what's called the crab mode. Crab mode means that these wheels here can turn perpendicular to the road that they're on and the car can move left to right. Whoa. <laughs> wow. so that would make parallel parking a lot easier. Absolutely. <laughs> it's a game changer. That's it's a, a total game changer. So for me, I think of all the cars, and I'll just run through a couple of more, but of all the cars that are listed on this particular feature, I think this is a standout for me. I mean, the ability to move left to right and even diagonally is quite, a, uh, I think, a feat of engineering for, for cars. Is, so that's the, yes. Is the opportunity for it to do crab mode really only possible because of how it's an engine and not a motor? Like, is there internal structures that now allow crab mode because of the change in how the car functions? That's a great question. I'm going to say that probably not. I imagine that they would be that in the, as a design feature that they would, or that would be a, um, the ability to do crab uh, walk, if you will, would take place regardless of whether you're a, a motor or an engine. That's gotcha. just, yeah. I just happens to be a design feature that, um, General Motors uh, applied to this particular model of, the, of their Hummer, but I think it's amazing. Actually, <laughs> I want to. I want to test. I think it's more. interesting because you know that somebody wrote a comment in in, um, in the chat about you know how you know whether we need legislation um, you know to to move the the consumer investment in electrical vehicles forward. And I mean, there's definitely a place for that given the rate at which our our Earth is warming. But it's also interesting to see how you know, the, all of these different designs coming back to some of the ideas that we were talking about earlier, like create different entry points for people to enter the market, um, you know, based on, you know, use and design rather than, you know, sort of the efficiency. It's like, you know, instead of just like, you know, hiding your vegetables <laughs> in your dessert or whatever, right? Like, I, I would argue... <laughs> I would argue that one of the most compelling, one of the most compelling aspects of this is this comment that says, doesn't Tesla want to sell a $15,000 electric to make it more affordable? And you know, that has, that has certainly been one of the uh, roadblocks to people right. purchasing electric vehicles is that the price was so high to begin with. Uh, now, I'm not sure the price that Tesla's looking towards is 15,000. The last I heard was 35. But that's way better than some of the models that start at 160,000. Right, like this truck. example here. The like Lucid, this one, right? example. sure, right, right. So I think that's another enticing aspect that now people have options for a direction that they want to go that's sort of like morally acceptable, but also works for them financially. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, right, some models at different price points and also different utility, right? A lot of these that are listed on this particular website are in the utility vehicle market. So you'll see a lot of um, uh, cars that, um, you know, that are featured here and much more sort of rugged uh, terrain and the luxury market. And then also the high performance market. So up here I showed, uh, this is the new Maserati MC20. Um, again, this idea of electric vehicle technology is being applied across the board for all different types of models and all different price points. So this is really where the future is going. And uh, I, th I think it's exciting. Yeah. It's funny, you've been like scrolling through and I remember when I read this article, I think it's one above this, it was the Citroen Ami. It's a very compact car. It's actually a quad oh, cycle. Yes. Yes. No, not that what I feel like it was something sooner in the link. Or maybe they moved it. Sorry, I'm but trying they, to make I'm trying to make everybody juicy. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Woo. Okay. Where is it? It's a, you're talking about the little tiny the very tiny one that not, not that one. Um this is that, cool. Whoa. It wasn't the canoe. That just looks like a toy. <laughs> I think it's earlier in the in the article, but it lists okay. it as like a quadricycle which talked about how it's road legal, but can also be driven by like a 14 year old, which is like the strangest thing I learned from that. There, oh, there we are. 
but also the way it's manufactured, which is really cool, is that everything, the doors open in different directions yes. because it's the same piece is used and like the bumper in the front is used. So it's also inter exciting. Yes. Like, you know, reading about electronic vehicles, I'm also learning about these other clever design engineering decisions these manufacturers yeah. are making. Right, right. It definitely feels like kind of a sandbox to just like yeah. try different things. I mean, the mm -hmm. range of just the, the range of designs that you've shown us, Daryl, is, is really fun. Yeah, to quite look at. yeah it's fun, right? It's fun. <laughs> And the only, the last thing I'll say is like, there are incentives, right? So all of the, there's the federal incentives and the state incentives. So here are locally in Pennsylvania, the Department of Environmental Protection, there is what's called the alternative fuel rebates. Uh, and there's rebates for hydro fuel cell uh, based cars at a thousand dollars, the battery electric, such as the uh, vehicles that I've shown here up to $750 and hybrid electric vehicles, compressed natural gas and propane fuel vehicles, as well as electric motorcycles up to $500 uh, rebate. So if you have more questions about that, we can put some information in the chat. And of course, you know, happy to answer other questions from folks. But yeah, just wanted to share kind of where the EV market is going. Yeah, there's a great observation here that in addition to from the audience that in, in addition to all of the engineering that's going into the cars, all of the um, new engineering that's going into artificial intelligence and, you know, automated driving systems like these are all kind of coming together in, in really interesting ways. So and we'll to see add where we to, go in the next. Well, <laughs> yeah. And to add to what Adam was just talking about, about experiences, too, there's a whole push now for in the auto industry, really taught, thinking about the user experience and not just functionality, but also you know, how we can create and design uh, spaces that are much more personalized and things of that nature. So it's the, the interconnection of, of that world as well. You know, maybe I can combine this technology with uh, with a shopping service and just have the car go out and do all of my Christmas shopping for me. <laughs> Save time, energy, <laughs> maybe not money. <laughs> maybe none of the above. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks sir, for taking us through that interesting Absolutely. tour of electric vehicles. I'm up last, and I I wanted to talk about a story that has been in the headlines just in the last few days, um, which is that the first pig heart was transplanted into a living human being, which kind of blew my mind. Um, <laughs> this wasn't even your first choice story, was it? It wasn't, but once I read it, I couldn't not talk about it because, you know, this is, you know, we've been talking about how, you know, sometimes, you know, whether it's in electric vehicles, whether it's immersive experiences, like different threads of technology or science, you know, come together to make something new possible. And I think this is an example of that idea in biology. Um, so, you know, just to kind of paint the picture of the need for this, um, this kind of work is that, you know, there is an organ shortage crisis. Um, here in the U.S., um, there are statistics that 17 people die every day waiting for an organ, and over 100,000 people are on the waiting list for an organ. And you know, one of the challenges is because, you know, our, you know, organs are so complex, you know, we're still not at a point where for most organs, we can grow them, you know, synthetically in a lab. Um, and, and, and so, you know, to, to, to that point, you know, there's a, a note from the audience saying, you know, wouldn't a robot heart be better? Well, you know, biology is incredibly complicated that in fact, like, you know, evolution can build things that humans cannot. Um, and so we don't have a way to, you know, create living organs um, of the complexity of something like a heart yet. Uh, and, and that's one of the things in addition to the fact that, you know, organs are very sensitive to, you know, being transported. And so if you're, you know, for things like a heart, you have to be you know, within a certain geographic region um, to, to get a, a, a to, to be a candidate for a transplant in that region. So there are a lot of challenges to getting organs um, in the first place and then getting them to the people who need them. And so the idea of getting organs from animals um, has been around for a while, 
But one of the biggest challenges has been your own immune system, right? It's you know, bad enough when you get a heart transplant, you know, just getting an organ from a different person means that you have to have your immune system suppressed um, so that it doesn't reject uh, it as a foreign object. And so the challenge then of getting uh, organs from animals is just kind of magnifies that. But what made this possible is the advancement of gene editing. Um, you know, we, we, we're all hearing that acronym CRISPR as a technology that allows us to very precisely um, edit, knock out, add genes um, in different living systems. And so um, there's some very experimental research that has started to create genetically engineered pigs um, that then are less at risk of, um, in, you know, I guess, uh, uh, inciting in, in immune rejection when, when that organ is then transplanted into human. Um, and so the very first person was, um, got an experimental surgery um, earlier this month and has so far been alive for a week with this pig heart with so far, you know, no serious side effects. So this is exciting. It's, you know, it's, it's a little like, it's a little daunting for sure um, in terms of, okay, what, what are the unknowns that we don't know about? But it's also, you know, very promising in terms of where, you know, uh, new solutions to address the transplant crisis. I know for a while, like, weren't we using parts of pigs in human hearts? Like, weren't valve replacements something? It was that, has that been going on for years or had that stopped like a few years back? Yeah, so that, I, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure where the current status of things like that are. Um, I think there are more advanced valve replacement technologies that have come into play yeah. um, for something that is relatively of a simple structure, like a valve. Gotcha. Right? It's yep. where you get complicated. <laughs> a absolutely. Yeah. Right? That, that, that things get harder. <laughs> have there ever been attempts to use other animal organs? I mean, like a, a, a kidneys or anything like that? or? So in fact, the first um, experiments with pig organs in, um, in, in sort of full body systems was actually done last year, um, where the liver of a pig was transplanted into a person who at that point had been declared brain dead. Um, so even though you know, the rest of their body systems were still functional, they were no longer really alive. Uh, and, and certainly not in a position to then, you know, go out and, and live um, with this organ. So that was really an early experiment just to see if, you know, within the, the network of other functional organs, whether the body could sustain, um, you know, this type of uh, organ, uh, animal organ transplant. Um, and, and that went successfully. And so that gave people hope that, you know, we could then take the next step. Because ultimately, there are, there you can do experiments with transplanting into other primates, but nothing really prepares you, um, you know, of, for what will happen once you put it into a real human. So, so there's a question, Gerard, from the audience about a pig, is a pig more human than using technology? So, I would say it's closer to human tissue. <laughs> let's let's define it that way. Um, is that you know, our cells are incredibly complex. Um, even just designing cells right now, we're still starting from living cells. Um, we have not yet been able to design a, you know, from scratch, a, a fully synthetic um, cell that could then grow into something like this. Um, and so it, there's just so many hurdles to get past all of the, that functional complexity, if you're starting from basic components, um, that if we're trying to scale up to a point where we can meet the need for organs, then at this point, we don't have the technology to do that with, um, with, with starting with the basics. And does that include uh, you know, the, uh, the other technology that this reminds me of, you know, particularly in what you're just speaking of, is uh, trying to 
grow hearts and organs from stem cells. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that is a very active area of research as well. Um, certainly, you know, when we think about one of the biggest challenges being this issue of organ rejection um, from a foreign um, donor, then sure, if you can heart, you know, if you can like harvest your own cells and then grow them up into any organ that you want, that would be ideal, right? Because then you don't run the risk of, you know, of this mismatch. Um, but again, it's a question of scale, right? Like, you know, that is incredibly individualized. It is expensive. It is, you know, probably not accessible. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to raise pigs. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So this isn't a situation where, uh, you know, we can take a stem cell line and, uh, you know, grow 10,000 hearts. Right. And, We're you know, we still run into the issues of rejection because it's the stem cells from a particular individual growing a heart for that particular individual. Is right. That right. Okay. Right. It's going to take us a while to get to that technology. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's easier to just build a replicator. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, going going back to science fiction. I'm pretty I was sure going to say, yeah, right. <laughs> they they've definitely had you know I think it was like the island. Like there was another place that they grew humans of identical. So in case you lost something, you're like, don't worry, you're you're number two. Yeah. <laughs> right. Ooh. Ooh. Um, so Ooh. a department on the terraformed Mars. Well, ah, just there we that go. Part there. Okay. Mm. So one other point to make around the question of, you know, can, can you, is, is, is the pig more human than something artificial? So again, that, that, that needs a little definition, but in this case, um, um, among the genetic changes that were made to the pigs was to add six human genes, um, to the pig's genome that would help the pig's heart in a way be a little more human, human. Um, mm -hmm. to help, the, help it be accepted by the human body. Similarly, there were three genes that were actually knocked out that were, were found to then, tr that would activate an immune attack. So you're kind of taking it from both sides, like adding human genes to make it more acceptable, taking away the genes that would increase um, the likelihood of rejection. So, you know, this is going to continue to evolve. You know, there are a lot of questions around it. Like if it's successful, you know, who gets to be eligible mm -hmm. for, for this kind of a transplant? Which organs would work best for this kind of technology? Um, you know, so for instance, like li liver transplants are much easier to come by. And so mm -hmm. that's not high on the list um, to develop, you know, animal organs for. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there is a high need for lungs um, but lungs are so fragile that lung transplants are very difficult. Mm. Um, so, so there are other factors that are going to play into how this technology advances. This is fascinating. Also curious as we get down the line with like other animals, like what happens if you use the parts of an animal that behaves differently? You know, like if like lungs, like maybe the lung from an amphibian works best, like who knows? Um, but like, you know, then what does that mean for that person? Like that's also down the science fiction line, but like what other parts, you know, could end up being a result of that, which can be very fascinating down the line. It sounds like the island of Dr. Moreau. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, imagination, that's where it all starts, right? <laughs> Coming back full circle. <laughs> All right, well, thank you everybody for joining us here today. Um, before we close, I do want to give a little teaser that we've got some exciting new digital content from the Franklin Institute coming out soon. So stay tuned to our digital channels for that announcement. Uh, and in the meantime, keep exploring science. Um, we'll be here to answer questions. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Take care. Thank you very much. So long.